everyone. Um, thanks for being here today. I am Matt Leonard, the head of AI Learning, so the school of AI that you all heard about earlier today. Um, that is you know, kind of my baby. Uh, and today, I'm here with Salma Chintala, who is a uh, AI, uh, AI researcher at Facebook and the creator of PyTorch. So um, before we get started, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I, I'm an AI researcher at Facebook. I've been there since 2014. And uh, before that, I was at a startup doing music and machine learning stuff, like creating music uh, and uh, transcribing music. And before that, I was doing deep learning research. And that's pretty much all I have. <laughs> nice. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Um, so the, I'm going to be talking with Salma today basically about, about PyTorch, um, but also uh, careers in AI. So uh, at Udacity, uh, one of our main goals is to get people into you know, these jobs in AI. And like, the AI field is exploding. Uh, and so we just want to talk with Salma today about like, how students can actually you know, start getting into uh, these AI jobs. So uh, the first question, so I just want to uh, provide some context around what we're going to talk, uh, be talking about. So uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, and deep learning are all sort of used um, interchangeably, uh -huh. but they're actually quite different. Um, yeah. So I just wonder if you can like, provide us some context about uh, what are the differences between these and how do they relate. Sure. Uh, OK, so machine learning is what I think is what people are doing. And deep learning was invented as a term to get more funding from the government. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, deep learning was, uh, people, people started writing grants for, oh, I'm building this neural network, and NSF wouldn't give grants. So people were like, oh, we're doing deep learning. Um, but uh, now the way people are using deep learning is that if you use anything that's neural network based, if you use convolutional networks, recurrent networks, adversarial networks, any of that, that is deep learning. And machine learning is sort of referred to uh, as you probably are using neural networks, but you might also be using kernel methods or Gaussian processes or something like that. So machine learning is sort of like the broad field that covers multiple methods. And AI is sort of the entire field of, um, it, it's just the term for, for the, the broad field. Like it's not, it's, it's even hard to define uh, very well. Like, in AI, we don't even know the breadth of the field yet. It's sort of that very broad term. We want to get to AI. Um, and it covers things like expert systems that no one does anymore. And it covers a, a bunch of other things that not machine learning. Uh, that's not just like you know statistical correlations, but also covers like a broad set of other methods that people think are essential for intelligence. Great. Um, so my next question. Uh, I think I'm very similar to you in that I started studying machine learning and neural networks uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, and it was before deep learning was actually a thing, like a term. Like it just didn't really exist as deep learning at that point. So I was wondering, how did you get your start in deep learning and AI? Sure. Um, it was very accidental. I, I was generally interested in computer vision. Uh, I saw a TED talk by Steve Seitz, I think, from Microsoft Research. He was talking about how um, he took a bunch of pictures at a historical monument. And then his system, at the time it was called Photosynth, could automatically stitch things uh, in 3D. And, and for me, I was like, how do you match like one photo to another photo? Like, how do you know the correspondences? And I was in my third year of undergrad, and I was curious. And so I went down that path of like just trying to understand how these things were built. I actually wanted to go become a visual effects artist, um, a really bad one, because <laughs> like I actually went and interned uh, in a visual effects company, and they sort of kicked me out. And so this is my second choice. I tried to do some computer vision research uh, back in India at this university called IIIT. 
And then I went to CMU sort of on like a visiting program. Uh, I, I went there, spent some time at the Robotic Institute for about six months, where I was taking a course where you learned how to play robot soccer. And I was also working with uh, un like one other researcher at the Robotics Institute. And I was applying for a grad school. Uh, <laughs> at that time, I didn't get into all of my first choices. And I looked for where, do, where are they accepting applications late? And they do computer vision. And I Googled for that. And I saw this like really janky web page of Jan LeCun's where he claimed to be doing some object detection. And I was like, OK, I'll apply to NYU. And I got into NYU, and I emailed Jan. Uh, back then, that was 2010. He was not as busy as he is today. So he, he replied back to me, and he's like, oh, let's meet at this date and time. And he, uh, he met me, and he asked me, like, do you know anything about neural networks? I'm like, no idea. Uh, and he explained stuff, and he got me in touch with one of his PhD students. Uh, and I started working with the PhD student and slowly understood neural networks, backprop, worked on my first, uh, co-worked on my first deep learning framework called eblearn that was like first authored by this guy called Pierre Servanet. And then I graduated from NYU, couldn't find a job in uh, deep learning as it exists today, because there is no jobs in, in, in deep learning. And I went on to go to a startup that Jan LeCun co-founded, which just got funding. And it's trying to do like music generation doing deep, using deep learning on mobile phones. I did that for a couple of years. The business wasn't doing super well. And I was looking for other opportunities. And, and uh, among many. Uh, in 2014, Jan said, oh, I'm running this research lab now. Why don't you come in and uh, be an engineer? That's, that's the full story. Nice. <laughs> Great story. And so now you're working on PyTorch, which is a, a deep learning framework in Python, similar to like TensorFlow and Keras. So I'm really curious, you know, TensorFlow and Keras and Cafe, like all these deep learning frameworks existed when you started creating PyTorch. So like what led you to creating it and like kind of what, what did you see was missing that led to PyTorch? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I'll, I'll try to answer it without hurting people's feelings. <laughs> so when, so PyTorch started off, at, so at that time um, when PyTorch started, I was maintaining a framework called Torch. Um, it was based out of Lua, uh, which is this language that's obscure, uh, but it, th like there was a big deep learning framework uh, called Torch that, that used it. And it had a Keras-like model, um, and it worked pretty well, except that Lua as an ecosystem is really small. And also Torch's design has existed from like 2009, 2010, and you know how, as a field, as we move uh, in terms of research, uh, the tooling has to move with you. Otherwise, like, the tooling becomes irrelevant. It's not flexible enough for what researchers want today. So Torch's design was aging. Uh, and I was like, I need a new tool. And TensorFlow came like a year before that. And we tried it, and it just wasn't cutting it for us. Like, we, we couldn't debug day-to-day uh, -day things, and, and is, is like for us, like a, a very personal opinion, it was painful to use. So uh, then we were like, okay, why don't we just build something that's torch-based, but in Python, uh, that has a new design from all the lessons we learned from the last few years. And that's pretty much how it started. Great. Um, yeah, so as nerdy as this sounds, to have a favorite deep learning framework. Like PyTorch is my favorite deep learning framework. So Great. thank you for creating it. Um, so then how does PyTorch like, fit into kind of the, the ecosystem and workflow of you know, like, typical deep learning models? Um, how does it fit into the ecosystem and workflow? Well, you use PyTorch for everything. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't. I don't quite understand. Yeah. 
So, so in my mind, so kind of the, the workflow for deep learning, machine learning models is, you know, you kind of like identify your problem, and you start collecting the data and labeling it, and then you can train and build your model, and then eventually you have to deploy it somehow so your that users can use it, right? So then where, yeah, where's PyTorch fit into I see. that? So um, PyTorch enables you to uh, take your data, write rapid data loaders that are highly performant, in uh, very few lines of Python, and then write your model definition, however complicated it is, however crazy your idea or model is, and train it to convergence, and then you export it to like some deployable format, and um, you ship it to production. Uh, that's where PyTorch is. It doesn't yet cover things like uh, uh, shipping to mobile phones or shipping to like a Python-less production environment, but everything else uh, in the deep learning workflow it covers pretty well. Excellent. So then, uh, so with PyTorch, like learning deep learning uh, and AI in general. So what's your what's your actual advice for you know for students of ours or just you know people in general about like, how to actually get into the AI field, like actually get these jobs? get into AI, how to get the jobs. Um, my answer is that you back solve from what companies are looking for. So if you look at, uh, let's take like two sets, of, two types of jobs, right? One is jobs where you're sort of like a data scientist, but you're maybe like a deep learning scientist, right? Yeah. You, there's a lot of data lying around, or let's say you have to like set up data collection. Uh, you look at it from like a perspective of a company who, who needs someone like this uh, for the purpose of either collecting data and building a model and then integrating it into their existing product. Um, so the skills that you generally look for in those cases are understanding how to build deep learning pipelines that have not yet been built. Uh, understanding what data you need to build a model that can train well um, and how to collect such data. If you have limited data, how to augment your data well. Um, what kind of model should work well, like wouldn't work well. Those kind of intuitions are the skills that people look for. And as someone who's a student who's looking for a job, like one of the, one of the challenges is how do you sh give signal to people that you have those skills, right? Like you might have those skills, but there's a whole other part where like you have to like tell, show people that you have those skills. And I think one effective way is to um, build out some projects of yours on GitHub or write a blog post. Um, or like show that you built an app end to end that 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 uses deep learning successfully. Those those are the kind of skills you would need if you wanted an industry job um, where you're sort of like a data scientist slash deep learning scientist. Um, if if you want to be more of like an engineer who works in the like if you want to work on my team for example if you're a core engineer kind of a person. Then what I look for is core competency in computer science. You understand like threading, you understand uh, like all of these general computer science concepts, you understand programming very well. Um, and you just learn deep learning on a job. Like I, I don't particularly look for like, oh, you need to understand neural networks or backprop. Those are those can be taught using, you know, a Udacity course. You don't need to like have four years of training for something like that. So for, for core jobs, I think engineering is the main focus, and even all of the deep learning aspects can be just learned on the job. Yeah. So uh, I think there's this uh, you know, perception of the AI field where you, you, know, you can't do any of this stuff unless you have a PhD, and, uh, which I think is completely wrong. I mean, just at Udacity, like the whole point of Udacity is we're taking people who don't have PhDs and we're teaching them to do this stuff. Right. right. So then, like on on your team, like do you like what's your opinion on like people with PhDs versus like? Sure. Um, I think we like in the first like 
when we built PyTorch, we had no PhDs on the team uh, who built PyTorch. And it's a pretty successful tool today. So um, the other data point, and as of today, like we have a couple of PhDs on the team, um, but it's not essential by any standards. Uh, that's the first, like, I want to give data points to just show that, that that's mostly a myth. And the second thing is, out of my graduating class at NYU, the, the master's class, um, there was like three or four of us who were into like machine learning slash deep learning. We all landed just fine uh, in doing uh, deep learning jobs, either at startups or at large companies. I think it's more of like whenever people look for um, people to hire, they look for whether that person has the skills necessary to do the job. One way, one really easy way is to look for a PhD and say, oh, you spent five years doing deep learning, so you must know like X, Y, and Z. But if you show those signals in any other way, that's also fine. Right. So I've heard a lot of... Um, so a lot of the commentary is about like people with PhDs like coming out of academia as compared to like software developers is that uh, like software developers even though maybe they don't have that experience with deep learning is, but they they know how to actually deploy software and make products that people use right um, so then like what type of, of people are you actually looking for on on your team are you looking for like people who have like more deep learning experience or more of like the traditional software developer engineer. I, I look for uh, someone who understands one, at least one side of the two-sided problem. Like we're building deep learning software, right? Uh, if they can understand deep learning really well, that they can come in and add new layers to PyTorch. Like let's say someone needed to add um, uh, generalized uh, like GESV, which is like like a generalized linear equation solver and make it back probable. Okay, they need to do some high school level math and derive the, the derivatives and code it up. Uh, someone who can do that, who, who is comfortable with calculus, or someone who is really good at uh, core computer science, who's a really good programmer who understands programming languages or, you know, like assembly, threading, like. SIMD, that kind of stuff. I look for either one of those aspects. Cool. So then, uh, so after our program, so we, you know, we do our best to to teach students, like set them up, um, get them ready to, you know, start applying for these AI jobs. But we also try to help them, like afterwards, right? And so try to teach them, or you know, at least like tell them what to do, so they can keep like upskilling after our programs. And so, what do you think are the best ways to do this? Um. Did they get a job or not? Oh yeah, so like in the, the process of like so job hunting. Before, okay, so yeah. after they finished your course, but in the process of job hunting, I would say like keep yourself busy, do Kaggle competitions, like read a research paper and implement it, build a home gardening bot, like do anything that'll just like keep your skills sharp. Definitely one of the things I would say, uh, is the most tempting thing to do is only read papers and not implement them. Or like, like it's like very easy to consume information but not act upon it. But like, you you can't really sharpen your skills if you don't do the second part. So that's that's all I would say. Right. And then what's the the best way to sort of stay up to date with like everything that's going on? Oh, the man. change is so fast. I mean, like with last last year, like PyTorch didn't exist, and now it exists, and yeah. Yeah. So that's a question I'm I've been trying to find an answer for. I can't stay up to date with everything <laughs> that's going on. Um, one way to see it is don't stay up to date with every single thing going on in the field. Look at one particular narrow path in the field and just stay up to date in in that narrow path and. It's not a bad idea because to stay up to date, like in the entire field, like go after every single project, that probably takes like a team of people. Yeah. Cool. Um, so then, like within these different fields, like are there any uh, projects that you're really interested in? Um, 
several. Uh, I over the last like I, I generally look for interesting papers that come out. Uh, I like generative modeling a lot. Um, generally, like image generation, video generation, uh, text generation. Like I kind of want to do fun things like, oh, can I generate a story from like given a small subplot? Or can I generate an image from like a description? Stuff like that I find interesting. And so I try to keep up to date in that particular subfield. And there's no specific way in which I do that. I just, um, like, because I work at a large research lab, I have bootstrapped information from like other people who heard about paper XYZ, and uh, that's how I do it. The other way is, I guess, um, find reading groups at your local university who usually reading groups are like, they read one paper a week and like present it and other people understand it. And it's kind of interesting uh, to, to just get a broad scope of things. Uh, the other way is like, just uh, use something like Archive Sanity, or uh, there are these tools that are popping up there. Like, if you have particular keywords that you're interested in, um, you'll get an email with like a daily digest of what papers are interesting in that in that particular uh, subfield. I, I would say those those ideas maybe. Great. Um, and so you're talking about your you're working on a big research team, right? So what's what's the day to day like for an actual you know AI researcher? Um, for an AI researcher, uh, I I don't know exactly. I I'm sort of between an AI researcher and an engineer. But for a researcher, typically what I see them do <laughs> is I see them come in. Um, read a paper or two, go to go to reading meetings, uh, go to do a lot of discussion about like how to evolve their idea, do a lot of coding. It's a lot of empirical stuff as well. It also depends on like the kind of AI researcher. If you're an AI researcher that's focusing on mostly theoretical work, like you want to derive bounds for your model that are tighter than like known theoretical bounds, then you spend your whole day either in a room like bouncing ideas off of other people or like with a pen and paper deriving that. If you're more of an empiricist, you're like uh, someone who's building better con nets for like a particular task or something. You you build out your, your software, make sure everything's ready, and then like you change up the parts of uh, the parts of the system that, that you think you have new ideas in run them on the cluster, and then wait for the results. And in the meanwhile, like, like read papers, catch up on the field, that stuff. Cool. Um, so then, so yes, yeah, so we have these like AI researchers, AI engineers building these systems. Um, are, there, are there any bottlenecks as far as like, like what's kind of like what's, is there anything preventing you know, all these companies everywhere building like AI systems? No, money, I guess. Yeah. So um, I've been hearing a lot about, I mean, I guess like the thing is there's not enough data. It's like the data part is, that is the tough part, right? Um, so then in, you, in your experience, like what's the best way to actually kind of collect like all the data you need? Because I mean, so ImageNet, which is like the big one that all the, that kind of set off deep learning is, you know, tens of millions of images, right? So how does uh, like a team actually collect and label all this data? Yeah, so it's every every data collection process is um, creative and different. Um, it depends on the problem. It's it's very personalized to each particular problem. So if you're collecting data for say healthcare, um, it's a very different process. Like the bottlenecks are on like convincing people. Uh, that you'll keep the data secure, that you'll make sure uh, you're using it for the right purposes and all of that. If you're collecting it for, say, um, um, academic purposes, then like your bottlenecks are like, uh, oh, like we need to get people to label the data and make sure like they're triple labeled and like like the labels are accurate and it's not just someone just clicking A for everything. 
uh, and all of those things, um, and like probably funding as well. Um, so every every different data collection is bottlenecked in a different way. So it's the solution is not like generalized. Yeah. Um, and then what do you what do you see as like the one skill that is most in demand, like uh, amongst industry and like all these companies who are trying to you know start building AI things? Um, it's uh, being able to generalize your your skill to like the problem they have at hand. So um, doing a deep learning course is not enough, right? Like you, you need to be able to apply what you know to the real world. I think that's the skill that's, that's most, like that's, that's been the same skill that's in demand for like a while. Um, but especially in like a very high demand field like deep learning, a lot of companies want to hire like deep learning engineers and they want to build a small team that can take the problems they have and see if deep learning can be applied to them. And the company itself doesn't have any experts on um, whether this is co like correct and possible or not. So this, the skill really is like, can you go into an environment where you can work creatively by yourself and see if something can be applied? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so kind of like we're getting near to the end of our uh, little Q&A session. Uh, so then where do you see like deep learning and, and AI going? Like, what's the future of all this? Um, one of the big things, uh, well, where are they going is, uh, it's hard to tell, but if you see deep learning, it's becoming a very, um, a very pervasive technology. Like it's sort of everywhere in every different application. You see people are like, oh yeah, this system, we did it this way for the last 25 years and now we just switched it over to like this other method um, by just pumping more data and putting a network, neural network there. Uh, that way it's sort of going into like all kinds of places that we didn't even think it would go into. Um, as a research field, it, it's, go, it's like the, the biggest problems people are working on are things like sample efficiency. Like one of the big challenges is like you need a lot of data to satisfy a deep learning system. Okay, why do you need a lot of data? Like why can't you learn with much lesser data like humans do? Is it like simply about transfer learning? Is it simply that humans just have priors on like so much of the world that they can transfer their skills using very little data into a new task? There's a lot of research going on there. Is it like just pure unsupervised learning, like you don't actually have to have any labels to, um, to get to a really good prior system. Like all of this research is uh, pretty uh, intensely being worked upon. Great. Um, yeah, so I've, I've heard some things, which I don't know if it's necessarily true, but like kind of the research part of deep learning is a little bit plateauing, or I think maybe like we're starting to hit like, you know, People just aren't really moving forward as much as like the applications part, right? That is uh, that is an accurate statement. So, the applications part, we like if you look at almost every single application we've seen, it's like, okay, you either take a ConNet or you take an LSTM, and you apply it to a very large data set using some standard loss function, and you get a really good system. That's like the tried and tested recipe that's been that's been used. Um, on the research side, we're not seeing like methods generalized. Like we don't know what to do about unsupervised learning or transfer learning, like whether they work effectively. That like their progress is slower, but I think that's just expected as well. Like yeah. um, you you don't sort you don't know when breakthroughs come. And until they come, you're sort of like, oh, things are going nowhere. Yeah. Um, and then what is like the one application of deep learning that you think like somebody should do, but nobody has yet? 
If I knew, I would go to it. <laughs> You'd make your own company? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I can't think of uh, anything in particular. There's a lot of like things that I feel like there exists. Like there's a lot of healthcare in deep learning that should exist already, but they're not. So like I think someone should do that, but then like if I actually go dig in, I'll probably find that they're being bottlenecked for reasons that are not technical, right? So like, I can't think of a particular application that's sure shot, I know can be done, but is not being done. Awesome. So uh, that's all the time we have for today. So thanks for coming, and thanks for talking with us. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. thanks.